بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كرمنا بني آدم وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Of the most important elements of prayer is the qira'ah. And the qira'ah, we spoke about takbiratul ihram, seeking refuge from the shaitan, and then we bring, begin in, with the recitation of the Holy Quran. Imam Rida alayhi salam, he says that the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed this within the prayers is so that the Quran does not get lost and the Quran does not get neglected. That it must be recited in prayer and it must be recited in the Arabic language. And therefore, it is important for us to work on our recitation and make sure that we are reciting these chapters that we recite in prayer in the correct Arabic language. But more important than this, because this is the body function, the skeletal function of the prayer, that it's being prayed correctly with the way that it's being said. More important than this is contemplating and thinking about the meanings of what it is that we are saying. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse that I recited at the beginning, He said, we have most surely honored the children of Adam. And we carried them on the land and in the sea. And we bestowed upon them so many good things. And we favored them over much of what we have created. A proper favoring. That they have been favored. The sons of Adam, us, all of us, have been favored over all the other creatures and all the other creations. Of the most important parts of Surah Al-Fatiha is Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. The Basmala. This Basmala is something that you should use to begin all of the actions that you do. Whatever action you do. You're going to fix your car, Basmala. You're going to work on something in the house, Basmala. You're going to cook, Basmala. Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. You begin in the name of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That this action will then have barakah. In fact, the imams say that an action that doesn't have basmala before it is mabtura. That, that in other words, it's cut off. It's not a complete action without having bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the importance of this word, and we're going to go through just a brief understanding of what this word means. But this, in essence, when we say in the name, it means in, in the, with the elevation of Allah. This name of Allah, when we say Allah, This is the most complete name of Allah. That this means Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Mu'min. All of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are within the word Allah. Allah is the most complete and comprehensive word that describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the most complete and comprehensive word. This word is so important the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be recited at the beginning and then we say Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is, des- is describing an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he is merciful. And Ar-Rahim is from the same root word but uh, the, uh, Ar-Rahim refers to the specific rahma or the specific compassion and mercy that is only for the believers. This is exclusive for the believers. So we begin with this, in essence, this is a training of ourselves, and you will see within Surah Al-Fatiha, it reminds us of how we need to be between بين الخوف والرجاء, which means between fear and hope. And this is the way that it is. If you remember a few nights ago when we discussed perfection, that the perfect deed is in the middle. The perfect deed is not to any extreme. In fact, the perfect deed almost looks like it's coming close To falling off the rails, it's not. And we gave the example of a Formula One car. For example, why do we like adventure? What's fun about adventure? What's fun about speeding? And you shouldn't speed. But the fun thing about speeding is the risk. That at any point, you might deviate and lose your life. What's fun about an adventure? You know, if you go for a walk in the park, it's a walk in the park. 
But if you go trekking in Machu Picchu, or if you go trekking in, uh, uh, in, in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, this is adventurous. Why? It's dangerous. Something may happen. That you're on that, that edge. When you're praying, it reminds you that in your life you need to be between fear and hope of Allah. But if it's too much fear, then that'll take you to despair. You'll say, oh, no one's going to make it into heaven. And if it's too much hope, you're going to say, oh, I don't have to do anything. Allah is ar rahimeen I'm not going to fast for the next three days. Allah Rahim ar I'm going to, you know, go and party at this party for one night. It's only one wedding. That's, that's the wedding. You know, I have to dance at my daughter's wedding. It can't be. I can't let this go, for example. And someone tells you, this is haram. They say, Allah Rahim ar is the most merciful. So going that way as well is negative. That you have to be somewhere that's in between Bain al Khawf and Raja. And we see that within Surah Al Fatiha, this is basically what we repeat to ourselves when we read. Because the hadith says if you want to speak to Allah, make dua, recite a dua. And if you want to listen to Allah, then recite Quran. Because you will hear that message from Allah. And the message from Allah begins in His name, the Most High. And then He says, Ar Rahman, this mercy that Allah speaks of. This envelops everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created mercy in 100 parts. One part is in this dunya and it's spread amongst all the people. So anytime you feel like you miss someone, you want to see them, that's part of the mercy of Allah. Every parent that loves their child, that's part of the mercy of Allah. Everyone that's kind to one another, that's part of that one part of mercy. And the 99 mercies, Allah has saved them for the day of judgment. So this one mercy is shared amongst everyone. One day, there was a, uh, a man that was asking about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he saw a woman holding a child. So the imam pointed to the woman holding the child and he said to him, this, or the prophet, sorry, this is the mercy of Allah is keeping that woman in love with that child. You know how we say that even the monkey is a gazelle in the eyes of, of the mother. That it doesn't matter, no matter how ugly the child is, the mother loves her child. He said, oh, if I ask Allah to remove that mercy from her heart, you will see what she does. And so he asks Allah to remove that mercy from her heart. The child had soiled himself, so she just puts the child down and walks off. This is a defective child. Soiled himself, just puts him and walks off. And then, uh, then he does dua for Allah to return that mercy to her heart. She runs and she picks up the child. She says, my beautiful child, she cleans him up, everything. That that love that's there, that's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is part of that mercy, that, that uh, Rahmaniyyah. When we say Ar-Rahman. Ar-Rahim, this is specific to the ones who are believers. But within it, Imam al says that within Surah Al-Fatiha, there is no piece of writing or no thing, he has that shape, that contains the goodness that is within Surah Al-Fatiha. No other chapter in the Qur'an Nothing, no other saying that contains what is within Surah Al-Fatiha. And beginning with, as soon as that introduction is over, the most important thing is said. The first verse in the Holy Quran, in, in Surah Al-Fatiha after uh, Al-Basmala is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. This, this word is so important because it shows... The gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if there is any praise that is worthy within this world, then it's due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nobody else. No one has a stake in it. No one has a thing in it. Because everything is from Allah. And everything else, every other creation. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, لا يملكون نفعا ولا ضرا ولا موتا ولا حياة ولا نشورا. They do not command life nor death nor resurrection. They do not command goodness, nor badness. They can't. They don't have any command over anything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything that's good except it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of these good things come from Him and therefore praise is due to Him. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, He says to him, Nabi Musa asks him, How shall I thank you? How shall I show gratitude to you? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, how will you show gratitude? So he begins to think, and he says, Ya Allah, every time I want to thank you, I think about that even that thanks that I give is from you. You're the one that's inspired me to thank you for what you've given me. 
And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, this is the proper thanks. This is the proper gratitude that you have understood that everything that you have and even the gratitude that you show is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam one day, he tells his companions, I'm going to thank Allah a complete, a complete gratitude. Complete gratitude. So they sat around waiting to see what is this complete gratitude that the Imam is going to say. And so the Imam said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. All praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. Or he said, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. That this praise is the most complete thanking that you can give. And this, in essence, is the object of worship. This is the objective of worship, is for us to show this gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thank Him for everything that He has given us. In another conversation, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to Nabi Musa alayhi salam, He tells him, Habib ilayya ibadi. Let my servants love me. And He says to him, Ya Allah, how do I do this? How can I make them love me? He says to him, remind them of the graces that I have given them. Remind them of the bounties and the graces that have been given to them. And so he begins to understand that for us to form that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's about remembering the graces and the benefits that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. And so if you sit and you contemplate, last night we spoke about tafakkur and thinking and contemplating about your life. Think about the good graces that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you from every moment within your life. And this is something that we should take that time to sit down and consider. For example, in sajda to shukr or after prayers, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sometimes we can't fathom what this thanking should be. But we have many du'as that talk about exactly what these things are. But of these things is the fact that, as we mentioned last night, we said that every minute, 35,000 billion blood cells flow through your body. They travel 94,000 kilometers within your body. 35,000 billion blood cells. Do you know if one of these blood cells was to coagulate and clot in a capillary, you would have a stroke? You would have a stroke. But Allah makes every one of those cells flow freely. The oxygen that you breathe. Everything that you have, this is from Allah. And this is just talking about the physical. The fact that the planet that we live on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created it in a way that through the rotation of the earth and the core of the earth, apparently it creates radiation belts around the earth that stop the radiation from the sun reaching us. Otherwise, if that stopped for one minute, have you seen what happens to people at a, that, that witness a nuclear meltdown? That if they look at the nuclear meltdown from kilometers away, they will die within 24 hours from some, some cancer. This is in Chernobyl. This was something that was documented in Chernobyl, yeah. amongst uh, other things that were documented. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows this earth to be this way. You think about it, we place a piece of wood, a piece of timber, a seed, into the earth, and that timber, that little seed that's dead, comes to life from the soil that it's in and the water that reaches it and grows into a tree and bears fruit. And all these trees get the same water, the same water, but each gives a different flavor of fruit, a different type of fruit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made this earth in this way so it's habitable for us. That we can inhabit this earth because of what is there. And then look at it from the other side. The ala. The na'ama. The na'am are the physical bounties that we get. The ala generally talk about the internal and spiritual bounties that we have. Of these bounties is that you are born and from the moment that you are born you nearly kill your own mother. This is how much trauma that your mother goes through. And then from that beginning point, as Imam Zain al-Abidin, Imam Sajjad, when he talks in his treatise of rights, that from that moment you were born, your mother cares not if she is hungry as long as you are full, nor if she is thirsty as long as you have had something to drink, nor if she is cold as long as you are warm. 
Nor if she is healthy as long as you are healthy. That's all she cares about. She is willing to sacrifice her whole self for you, for your existence. And then imagine that. What do you do as a baby? Nothing. You do nothing. Some people stay babies till they're 25 years old. They just leech. They keep sucking the teeth of their parents until, until what? Their parents have to do everything for them. They even have to think of the career that they should take. They have to get them their job. They have to give them every little thing. They have to even fill in their book to get their peas because they refuse to fill in their book. They don't even want to write a few lines in a book. This is the human being. And then imagine we are so weak and useless that if at any point while we are in our crib we turn on our face, we will suffocate. We will suffocate. Allah puts the mercy in your parents to keep checking on you and make sure that you're the right way up so you can actually breathe. You're so helpless and yet Allah sends these caring parents that they didn't start thinking of you that day. They started thinking of you before you were even born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thought of you before you were even created onto this earth. Before you were even a thing. Was there not a time where the human being wasn't a thing worth remembering? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had you. Ya qadim al ihsani ilayhi. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ancient in his goodness towards you. From before. And then these people. And we mentioned that, the, the probability of you being born. But then these people, the whole time, this is all they're thinking about. Wake up in the middle of the night to make sure you are still breathing. And then from that, they look after you. Every in your, in your best and your worst. In your best and your worst. They bathe you, they feed you, they nurture you, they educate you. They do all of this. All of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you know what's even better? What do we do when we get good things? The human being, when he gets good things, he becomes oppressive. And do you know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does? Allah covers up. Allah covers up. Do you remember that narration? Where he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on every human being, he sends down angels, a large number of angels. And they cover you with their wings. So nobody can see the bad things that you do. Subhanallah. They cover you with their wings. Your bad intentions, they get covered. The actions that you do, they get covered. Allah says, give him time. Give him, till the angels say, oh Allah, this guy is shameless. He's shameless. You've covered for him and he just keeps doing it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, disperse. I will cover you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala covers you. Until he keeps doing it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes his veil. But that whole time he keeps that veil. And even no matter what you do, you still receive this unconditional love from these people around you. He still allows the society to look at you as a person that is valued. And therefore, it's worthy when we say, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is what we are saying when we say this. When we're standing in the Quran, when we're standing and reciting the Quran in Salah before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we're saying Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, this is what I should be remembering. I should be remembering that how many a time, how many a time that you're living your life and you're working, and then you get ill once, and you're not sure how bad that illness is, and then you start thinking, Oh my god, I don't think I can work anymore because of this illness. What am I going to do? How am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to pay off my mortgage? How am I going to do and you think that's it, it's gone, it's gone. They're going to diagnose me with something bad. My back is gone forever. My legs are gone forever. Or this, you know, IBS isn't going to leave me alone. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He brings you back from that. All it is is just telling you that, look, remember, come back and remember what you are. This is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Do you understand the, the, how Allah is so loving towards us? And yet look at us the way that we are. We react back towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he is not worthy of anything. And what is the human being? Do you know the human being, an onion, an onion contains between 5 and 15 times more DNA than a human being does? An onion. The scientists call it junk DNA. And yet look at how the human being progresses. This is all by the hands of Allah. Your health, your vision, your hearing, your sense of taste, your digestive system, that's fine. The smallest thing, I swear, if you get a... a, a 
If you step on a splinter or a nail in your foot, it puts you completely out of commission. If you stub your toe on a table, it puts you out of commission. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He allows all of these things to flow freely so you can live. Falakal hamd. We haven't even got to the most important of na'am that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. And then Allah reiterates, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. All praise is due to Him. And then Allah says again, the most merciful, the most compassionate. We already mentioned that before, but Allah says, say it again. So He reminds you again, when you think of all of these bounties, and you think about how ungrateful you are, you remember this again. Ar-Rahmaniya wa rahimiya Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. And then we say, Maliki yawm din Master of the Day of Judgment. Owner, commander of the Day of Judgment. So Allah is remember, reminding you that all of this is under His ownership and then there will be this Day of Judgment that you will be judged upon. وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَى This is what we're thinking about in our prayer. That's what we're meant to be thinking about. Not, I've got to finish this so I can finish that off and go home. Not, I have to finish this because it's iftar already. Not, I have to finish this because they're going to start the second half very soon. No, no. What you're meant to be thinking about is that this is the master of the day of judgment. There is going to be this day where the only one in command is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In this world, this is the case. But we are asleep away from it. We think that it's all within our hands, it's all under our command, until every now and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us otherwise. But on this day of judgment, this is going to be the domain and the dominion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لِمَنِ الْمُلْكِ الْيَوْمِ The hadith says, that on the day of judgment, before resurrection, once everyone has been killed, everyone di- has, has died. There's no one alive anymore except for the angel of death. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angel of death, die. And he dies. And there is no one left alone then, uh, uh, around Allah then says, to whom is the dominion on this day? Who owns? Our whole lives, this is what we talk about. I bought this and I owned this. And this is how smart I was, the way that I bought this. And what I did, he actually wanted this much, but I negotiated down to 20%. And this is my property portfolio, and this is my share portfolio. And this is my, whatever it is, everything is about our ownership. Oh, this shirt, this is an exclusive shirt. These shoes, they only made four of them. And I was able to get one. And this is what I wear. Like that guy, I don't want to mention his name. (laughs) Mal'oon. <laughs> he had these shoes and he didn't want to dirty them, so he made his bodyguards hold him from his car to wherever, where, to whatever jahannam he was going to. And they held him to his shoes, so he doesn't dirty his shoes. Well, ayyadu billah, like the, the, the degree of, of arrogance. The degree of arrogance. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, all dominion is mine. Everything. And this is the case. Yet, yeah, we just don't fathom it. We don't fathom it. If you have a look, just a small... Uh, um, a small theoretical experiment Just a small contemplation yani, in your mind And just think about who's the richest man in the world today And you all tell me, you know, Musk or Bezos or Gates or whoever Or the guy that owns, uh, what's it called, Louis Vuitton And then I ask you the same question Who was the richest man in the 1970s, for example Who can answer that one? Even the people that were around in the 1970s can't answer that one. And I'll tell you who was the richest man in the 1900s in the world. He's gone. And all the property he had is gone. And everything that he had has disappeared. That wealth means nothing. It's nothing. Maliki Yawm din Commander of the Day of Judgment. Master, owner. Whatever word you want to put towards it. The Day of Judgment is his. This is the day where everyone comes forth and the truth is shown. Everything that's hidden comes out and everyone gets judged for everything that they have done. For everything that they have done. Yawm al-adl al-adhalim ashad min yawm al-jawr al al The day of justice against the oppressor. <coughs> These oppressors. I'm talking about all of them. From the first oppressor, Iblis, from the first oppressor that oppressed 
Rasulullah and his progeny. And the people that they'd placed in power after them. Every single one of them would stand to judgment. On this day, every single person that is pleased with the oppression that is happening in Gaza, they will all be judged for that. These people that are here, the police officers that are heavy-handed with the protesters, and they harm them and they arrest them, they're all part of it. Everyone is part of it. These journalists that write rubbish and trash and support and back them up, these TV show talk hosts that can talk and talk and talk and argue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment will say what? اليوم نختم على أفواههم We will seal their mouths. Shut up, you've said enough. It's finished. Seal, don't talk. Allah will tell you what's happening. That's Maliki Yawmuddin. Now think about that. When you're praying, think about how do you speak to your parents? When you're praying, think about how do you speak to your wife? How do you speak to your children? How do you speak to your mother? How do you speak to your father? Maliki Yawmuddin. There's a commander of that day. This is what the prayer is about. It's reiterating this. And then inshallah, I don't know if we can get through the whole thing tonight. And this is just very brief what I'm saying, mind you. That the exclusivity of worship is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unto you we worship and unto you we seek aid only. Worship is exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Exclusively. Now what does this mean? People take this as the meaning that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this, this is it, that he is obviously who I obey and I command. But their understanding of Allah comes through some guy and they just accept what he says. Some guy. And they accept what this guy says. I'm not talking about the prophets. I'm not talking about the imams. I'm talking about the people that said, Hasbuna kitab Allah. That the book of Allah is sufficient to us. I remember this tweet on a, on a lighter note. Anyone play Uno? And so... Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So the makers of Uno tweeted that you can't put a plus two on a plus two. So the response to it was, thanks for the cards, we'll take it from here. <laughs> this is Hasbuna Kitab Allah. Straight out. Thanks for the book, we'll take it from here. Amrukum Shura Bainakum. They say that Allah told us our command should be consultation between us. Yes, your command should be. Do you want to put a second toilet in the masjid? That's your command. Put a second toilet in the masjid. That's your command. But Amrullah, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is different. This is his command for him alone. They come with the weakest of arguments. Imam Ali called his son Abu Bakr. And so, if that's the case, if he did or if he didn't, what, what does it mean? Uh, this is the big strong argument that they come with. Mother Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Who else did he say about? When he, was, when he partnered between all of the companions. And he says, أنا وعلي من شجرة واحد وسائر الناس من شجر شتى That me and Ali are from one tree and everyone else is from a different tree. Who else did he say that to? Hadith al you are from me. بمنزلة هارون من موسى إلا أنه لا نبي بعدي You are from me like Aaron was unto Moses except there is no prophet after him. Who else was that said about? Husaynun minni wa ana min Husayn. Al Hasan wal Husayn imaman qama aw qada. Who else was this said about? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Amr, He decides how it works, not you. Oh, don't ask anyone, you have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa abtahu ilayhi li wasila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this. And we have so many narrations where people. Have tried this, they say, oh, the rizq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course the rizq is from Allah, 100%. So that man said, oh, since that's the case, I'm just going to live in my little hovel and I'll wait for Allah to bring my rizq. So he went into his little hut and he sat down. One hour passed, two hours passed, five hours passed, he started getting proper hungry. Felt like a snack pack. So as he's laying there, he begins to scream. I'm hungry, I'm hungry. So a guy walking past hears him, he comes, he says, what's wrong? He says, I'm starving. So he slaughters a sheep and he feeds him. 
So he says, subhanAllah, the rizq came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course the rizq came from Allah, but it's your wit screaming and whinging that got the guy to come and he felt so sorry for you that he slaughtered the, the, a sheep that he had to feed you. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yes, get up and work. Learn. I've given you the faculties to do this. Do it. And I've given you the faculties that send you on the path towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are Muhammad wa al-Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Muhammad. And so when we say we seek only from him, that's what it means. We say, Ya Allah, who do we go to? He tells us this is my prophet. We tell the prophet, who do we go afterwards? The prophet was very clear about it. Yani the smallest argument we have is inni tarikun fikum athaqalain kitab Allah wa atrati ahli bayki. Wallah, this is the smallest argument. The weakest argument we have is that, and that's the Prophet. The Prophet specifically articulating word for word who will be after me. My Ahlul Bayt, this is what you hold tight to and you will never go astray. It's specific, but if you look at the rest of it and what's before it and the whole history beforehand, it's crystal clear. It's weak, it's actually shameful to come with silly arguments like Imam Ali called his son Abu Bakr. This is like the worst argument I've ever heard in my life to come and counter this so means unto you exclusively Ya Allah you tell us who the prophet is you tell us who the khulafa are afterwards you tell us who the imam is you tell us what the book is it's what you say and Allah made that clear from the beginning with the whole story with Iblis and Nabi Adam prostrating to Nabi Adam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the command of Allah. This is obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and knowing that it's only Allah and it's only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah amma yushrikun. Wa man yuti'a Allah. Wal rasoola fa'ulaika ma'al ladina an'ama Allahu alayhim min al-nabiyyin wa al-siddiqin wa al-shuhada wa al-shuhada'i wa al-salihin wa hasuna ulaika rafiqa. After we say, iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us onto the path. This is something that is essential. To daily ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. There's a beautiful dua after Salat al-Fajr. It's sort of like along the lines of dua al-Ghariq. It says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wahdina lima khtulifa fihi min al-haqq bi-idhnik innaka tahdi man tashau ila siratin mustaqim. So, O oh Allah, praise the Prophet and his progeny and guide us, guide us into what is correct among the confusion and dubiosity. Guide us to the righteous and correct path. For you guide whomsoever you please to the righteous and correct path. <laughs> this is the Sirat al Mustaqim. It's one straight line. Even the Prophet, they put it so simply. We have many different levels of narrations. So you have narrations that are complex and you have some narrations that are simple. I haven't heard a more simple narration than this. The Prophet was with his companions and he drew a line in the sand. He said, this line is a sirat al-mustaqim. And then he drew lines on the right side and he drew lines on the left side. He said, these are all the other surat. These are all the other subur. These are all the other lines. All of them are incorrect. There's only one. See that straight line? That's the correct one. Can it get any clearer than that? It can't get any clearer than that. That there is one... Clear and straight path. This straight path is the following of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And the acceptance of the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam This is Allahumma sallallahu alayhi wa muhammadin wa alayhi muhammad. This is the right and the straight and the righteous path. And it's something that has been given to us so obviously. The reason in the prayer we have to understand and think about this. That this is what we are repeating over and over again. Sirat al an'amta alayhim. The path of the ones that you have given your bounty upon. Ghayr al maghdubi alayhim wa There's a very important part here. <laughs> There's a very important part here. And what this basically means is this two. Aspects. So we say, oh Allah, guide us onto the straight and righteous path. The path that you have guided the ones that you have given your blessing upon, as we said in that verse in the Holy Quran, 
They are the ones من يطع الله والرسول فأولئك مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم Whoever obeys Allah and his prophet then he is with the ones whom Allah has given his bounty upon them of the prophets and of the truthful and of the martyrs and of the good people and these are the best people to be with. He's talking about the prophet and his progeny, the imams of Ahlul Bayt. This is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about. So he says, we say, guide us onto this righteous path. The one whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given, given uh, them that righteousness. غير المغضوب عليهم Other than the ones that have incurred your wrath ولا الضالين The ones that have incurred your wrath are the ones that stood in the path of the Ahlul Bayt and went against them. 100%. We have different interpretations for what this means. But clearly this is what it is. The ones that stand in the path of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do that. And the misguided ones are the ones that think they are doing good. But really, they have fallen away from this. I just want to leave you with one small point to think about. Within this paradigm, there are two sides. There are really two sides. There's a beautiful hadith where the Holy Prophet, he says, أَكْثَرُ أَهْلِ الْجَنَّةِ al-bul." That the majority of the people of paradise are the simpletons. The simple people. These simple people, Allah grants them paradise. But there's an important concept here. It's not enough just to be simple and good and not know what's going on around you. This is not enough. You'll attain paradise. But you won't attain the levels of paradise without understanding the other side. And this is what this verse tells you at the beginning. At the end, sorry. It's saying to in this chapter in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, it's saying, oh Allah, guide us onto the righteous path. Not the path of the ones who've, who, who have incurred your wrath. You know, the ones who stood in direct opposition to the Ahlul Bayt. I heard this, it made my blood boil. There was an interview with this guy. And obviously not all the Sunni Muslims are like this. But this one man, he was, he, he was on, a, on a talk show. And he asked him. The Shia host said to him, Imam al-Hassan al-Mujtaba, is he in heaven or hell? His grave. Is it? Is it? Because uh, your grave is either Rawdam and Riyadh al Jannah, it's either a, par, a place of paradise, or Hufra and Hufra al Niran. So he says to him, Look, I don't know. How can I know? Allah knows who's in heaven and Allah knows. This is Sayyid, Sayyid Shabab Ahl al Jannah, Al Hassan al Mujtaba, who we're going to celebrate his birth tomorrow. He doesn't know. And then he says, I want to ask you, Abu Bakr, is he his grave? Rawdam and Riyadh al Jannah? He says, Of course. Most definitely. Omar, definitely. Uthman, definitely. Imam al Hassan, I don't know, bro. Yeah, this is a hard one. Well, Allah, it's something that makes your blood boil. That, that the, the, how deliberate that the truth is before them and how deliberately they, they veer away from it and look away from it. So it's important for you to know with everything, to know what the evil side is, to understand the knowledge of the oppressors. Imam al-Sadiq has a hadith where he, he, he talks about this. That we need to understand where the evil come from, comes from and how the evil people think to protect ourselves from wickedness and evil. It's not good enough to say, oh yeah, I love them all, everyone's good. No, this is not good enough. To know the good and at the same time, غير, غير المغضوب عليهم. Other than the ones whom Allah has have incurred the wrath of Allah and other than the ones that are misguided, that means you need to know who are the ones who have incurred the wrath of Allah. Who are the ones? Who are the ones that think they are doing good, but they are completely misguided? That they sit there and say, oh, we, follow, we follow Quran, this is what we just follow the Quran. Habibi, we follow the guy who sent the Quran down. And he's the one that tells us who we're supposed to follow and what the Quran means. Not just taking it from there. And so when we pray, this is what goes through your head. Rather than the billion other thoughts that come through. And this is how you attain that khushu'ah. Because the khushu' comes from understanding. Khushu' is humility and khudu' Khushu' is humility of the heart. Khudu' is humility of the body and the self. You can tell by a person the way they stand and what they do during prayer, what's happening within their heart. This is, again, from a tradition of the Holy Prophet, but I don't uh, have time to complete this. But the issue is, my brothers and sisters, when we begin our salah, takbiratul ahram, then iqamah, Intention that we spoke about that, Takbir al Ahram, Isti'ada min Shaitan al Rajim, and then Kira'at al Quran, Surah al Fatiha. When we recite this Surah al Fatiha, 
this is what we're supposed to be thinking about with each verse. With this sort of understanding, inshallah, and I hope from yani, the, the lectures that have passed before, inshallah, your prayers have been um, improved. I know mine have just from, from reading and learning from this verse. Inshallah, I hope that to a degree all our prayers have been improved. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow our prayers to be of the accepted prayers. As a narration, I just want to mention this before, before, before we finish, sorry. It's, it's important. One prayer, this is important, one prayer that is wajib, the wajib prayer that you pray, the obligatory prayer. The reward of it is 1,000 hajjas and 1,000 umrahs. As if you went to hajj a thousand times and you went to umrah a thousand times. One prayer. This is how important it is. It's much more important than any of the mustahab prayers. This is the most important thing. Focus on this. Get this right. And inshallah everything will be good. We ask Allah to hasten the reappearance of our holy imam. We ask Allah to have mercy on our dead to cure our sick. I really went over time. I'm so sorry. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not take us from this world until he is pleased from us. We ask Allah to, to cure our sick, particularly the ones that have asked for our dua. And to protect our youth and ourselves in the same way he protects the righteous of his servants against their lower selves. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma kun li wali. صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة لساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا دليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه <تصفيق>